Thank you very much, and welcome to UFOCon 2015. I'm your MC, Robert Perella. This is a Lorian Fenton presentation and production. Um, I'm very, very excited about our next presentation. Douglas Dietrich is with us. He is from San Francisco, California. I've known Douglas for a while, and I find him uh, to be fascinating in the field of just about everything. I call him a library of knowledge. Uh, he is a military historian. He is also um, a researcher in occult history, the Illuminati, symbolism, politics, international and domestic policy even. But today we are going to be looking at some classified documents that are also concerning Area 51, but also a very unknown presentation that I think you'll find incredible, the battle for L.A., what happened in L.A. I think you're going to find this an absolutely incredible presentation. Be sure and visit him at his website at douglasdietrich.com and his Facebook page, and he has DVDs for sale after the show. Come and meet him. See for yourself. This is the incredible Douglas Dietrich. Thank you so much. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Now, this is a presentation that normally would take an 18-hour college course. And, of course, because my mistress and manager, Lorian Ann Fenton, is mad at me, she says she's going to find me by taking this down to half an hour. So it will be impossible to get through it for 177 images. So do complain to her and allow her to give me my full time. Okay, so... We are now at uh, the title card, and there's some other issues that are going on with the presentation, as you might have imagined. We're going to be doing this at 75% images, but uh, basically, I started working with the Department of Defense uh, Library at the Presidio Military Base uh, as a research librarian when I was quite young, starting as an assistant at the age of 16, and when I was an assistant for the DOD as a librarian, ultimately becoming a full-fledged military reference technician, and then a full-fledged librarian with the credit equivalent of a master's degree in library science, I was also liaising with Letterman Army Medical Center. Letterman Army Medical Center maintained medical documents going back as uh, far as uh, several hundred years. Uh, it's important to remember that the Presidio military base is as old as San Francisco. It, it literally stretches back to the conquistadors. It actually existed before the city and county of San Francisco. The oldest building in San Francisco is in the Presidio military base. Now, Letterman Army Medical Center was important because it trained 25% of all the United States Army's doctors. It was ultimately destroyed, which is the situation you see it in, to destroy any and all evidence of the experimentation that was going on at Letterman Medical Center. So, uh, what they were trying to do was hide a lot of evidence that many people were protesting concerning an unholy alliance with experiments on prisoners in the state of California. So I dealt with medical records, dealt with a lot of medical documentation, so I know quite a bit about what I speak. Now we go back to Xanadu or Mongolia for a few moments here because it's very important to remember that the Mongols had the largest empire in world history in terms of a land empire, far greater than that of the Soviet Union. Most people are very unfamiliar with the Mongols and uh, what they did. Uh, uh, they were, of course, Buddhists, but they were also warrior people. And when they conquered all of the known world, one of the th ways that they did conquer it was to destroy the majority of human civilization with disease. They were the first people to use biological warfare. Now, this was, of course, noted by military doctors who do not sign the Hippocratic Oath. Most people are unfamiliar with this. If you become a military doctor, you are bought and paid for by the military. They pay for your medical education. Because they pay for your medical education in exchange, you forego, forswear, you forswear the Hippocratic Oath. So they study, of course, the way other people wage war. And the Mongols wage war by basically spreading an enormous amount of disease. Uh, this is the trade routes of the Silk Road, and it's along these routes that the bubonic plague uh, was following, and that is the red line that you see is all bubonic plague. This wiped out 200 million people. Now, the reason this is so astonishing is because at that point in uh, world history, we had something like just a fraction of the population we have today, meaning that the Mongols killed more than the communists, the national socialists, the Americans, and the British, and all the modern 20th century empires combined. Now, they did this by a, what most people suspect is, 
The rat. Now, the rat was uh, often blamed in Europe for carrying the peste or the pestilence. All of this is false. It is not true. It was not the rat that carried the Black Plague. It was the Asian gerbil. The Asian gerbil was brought by the Mongols in crates and cut loose well ahead of their advance. And it emptied entire cities. It emptied entire populations. For all intents and purposes, it killed most of the world. Now, uh, in terms of how it stopped, the Mongols stopped at Japan. They tried to invade Japan with the largest invasion fleet in history. We had uh, something close to 4,400 ships carrying hundreds of thousands of men and massive crates of gerbils from Asia, known as the giant gerbil that carries the pestilence uh, in all climes, as opposed to the rat, which is limited by climate. Now, in terms of uh, what they brought, it all sank with them. Now, this would take hours to go into and would take another uh, lecture. I've gone in, into it in the past in my DVDs. You can uh, hear about it on Satan's Crusaders if you purchase that sometime. But the Mongols stopped at Japan because the Japanese were able to call up what was known as the Kamikaze, or the Divine Wind. This was a storm that came out of nowhere on a summer day that sank the entire uh, invasion fleet of the Mongols. It would be the equivalent of the entire D-Day invasion fleet sinking with everyone on board every ship. Uh, well over 75,000 Mongol Marines drowned that day and all of the crates carrying the rats. So the Black Plague never made it to Japan. At that point in history, Japan had only 17 million people. Had those crates made it to Japan, Japan would not even be a world power today. You would never have heard of it. it would have been an island culture similar to the Philippines, very impacted by disease, very impacted by a uh, slow development. Now, of course, after that we had smallpox. This is very painful to look at. This African American is actually a slave who was freed uh, due to the Emancipation Proclamation. One of the reasons that the Emancipation Proclamation is uh, so hidden in terms of what Lincoln was intending with deportation of all the African Americans, which he had fully intended and had uh, definitely articulated, the only thing that stopped him from deporting every single African American back to Liberia was the fact that a Confederate soldier blew his brains out. Because of that, the African Americans were left in the United States free but uncared for. They were released from slavery, they had no care system, and they managed um, ultimately to die, no fault of their own, uh, through the contraction of smallpox and various other plagues that swept through the black community and killed millions of them. This was actually preceded uh, in the early days of slavery. We're going back to the Puritan colonies and the colonies of New England long before there was a constitutional republic. And at that time, we had men like Cotton Mather, a purely evil uh, individual, one of the vilest men that you've ever heard of, and you'll hear of plenty in this lecture. And he owned slaves. And of course, from their slaves, they contracted the African disease of smallpox, which wiped out half of Boston. So he found out from one of his black slaves that there was an ancient African voodoo technique of basically taking taking the blood from the dead people who had died of the disease and putting it into the living through open cuts. This would later on be known as vaccination or variolation. So he took that and he taught it later on through the Freemasons organizations to the man who would succeed him, George Washington. Now this is not George Washington. This is another scumbag uh, by the name of Horatio Gates. Horatio Gates was another white plantation-owning, slave-owning individual who wanted total power in the United States. And he joined George Washington in the rebellion. And when he joined him in the rebellion, he was constantly defeated by the British. Uh, one of the reasons was the fact that all the British had much better trained generals than the Americans. Uh, the other reason was that Horatio Gates and so many of these other slave-owning Americans uh, were infected with smallpox from all of their slaves. So all of the American troops began deserting because half of them were dying. Finally, George Washington inoculated them using variolation as originally learned from that African slave so long ago. So when that happened, the longest declared war in American history until World War II, which was the American Revolution, eight years long from 1775, until um, about 18-something, uh, uh, I can't even remember, 1775 plus 8. I'm real bad with math. But add that up, and we get to the end of it. <laughs>
And uh, the end result was, of course, you had a republic that created all kinds of other evil, demented individuals. One of them was Jack London. Jack London was a communist, a rabid communist, a full-fledged, card-carrying member of the Communist Party. He was also, like so many communists, an avid racist, as was indeed the original Karl Marx. Now, following the original Marxian ideology, before it was rehabilitated by uh, Engels, uh, what we would call Jack London would be a doctrinaire Marxian as opposed to an Engelian. And as a result, uh, like Marx, he felt that all of the colored pieces of, uh, peoples of the world should be exterminated. So uh, Jack London wrote a story called The Unparalleled Invasion. Now, this is very similar to what happened with atomic warfare. When Einstein uh, released the uh, mass energy equivalence equation, uh, E equals mc squared, every physicist in the world realized that that could lead to an enormous release of energy. So when that took place, everybody in the comics who heard of Einstein and in the Pulp Fiction began to write stories of atomic warfare. This was in the 1920s and the 1930s, long before the development of the atomic bomb. There has to be concept before there is development. So in the conceptual stories of the 20s and 30s, they talked about glowing cities. They knew that nuclear radiation would make things glow in the dark, hence the term nucatilic glows. Now, in terms of Jack London, he had known about the Mongols because he had actually been to Asia when he was learning about communism. They made movies about him trying to uh, release Russian prisoners of war who were kept by the Japanese from their various conflicts with the Soviet Union. And of course, he was someone who decided that all Asians should die when he became a police officer for the San Francisco and California Coastal Patrols, where he would shut down Chinese uh, illegal uh, shipping, uh, merchandising. And he felt all of the Asians were criminal peoples, uh, but uh, he said that we should use biological warfare like the Mongols used to exterminate every single person in Asia and replace them with white people who would repopulate China. And he called this democracy. Uh, this, of course, is what uh, has, and by the way, this is all in print in Collier's. He, this was published in Collier's, which was a very famous magazine of its day. It would be the equivalent of some such story being published in Time or Newsweek. And uh, at that time, of course, it was published in multiple languages and was read all over the world, including by Emperor Hirohito. Now, the young Hirohito is, of course, on uh, this side, which is uh, my, I believe that's your right. <laughs> and I have to think like a doctor, an MD, your right is my left because I'm always facing you. Now, in terms of this individual, here's General Nogi. Emperor Hirohito, of course, most people don't realize this. I have brought up the fact constantly that he was a marine biologist. This is why he became a marine biologist. He read the Japanese in, uh, edition of Collier's Magazine in which Jack London uh, seriously proposed the extermination of all Asian peoples on Earth using bacterial warfare. He decided he was going to become a marine biologist to defend his ethnicity and save Asia from genocide. Now, his parents did not raise him. The imperial family turned him over to uh, a stern samurai by the name of General Nogi, who was responsible for winning the Russo-Japanese War. So this is the first case in modern history of an Asian culture or a colonial culture defeating a Caucasian or European power. Uh, the first case before modern history was my own homeland, Taiwan, in which I was born, in which we managed to eject the Portuguese. We are the only pre-modern 20th century uh, nation or ethnicity that has ever defeated a gunpowder colonial power. Now, the Japanese, of course, incorporated my homeland of Taiwan, and we had a very positive colonial experience with Japan, as opposed to many other peoples. But General Nogi, of course, remembered all of that. He had lived through all of that, and he had fought uh, in the original, uh, he might have been very young at the time, but he was learning about the original Sino-Japanese War in 1895 when Taiwan became part of Japan. And, of course, he taught Hirohito everything he knew. Of course, he ultimately became terrified of Hirohito because Hirohito, uh, as a prince, stated that he was going to become a marine biologist to learn how to combat the European powers who were going to exterminate them all. And he thought of himself as a warrior. He thought of Hirohito as a monster. And Hirohito, in turn, uh, responded that General Nogi is a very brave man for the old kind of war, but he is a coward in the new way of war. Uh, General Nogi was so distract, distraught over the kind of warfare that was to come of people using populations as the battlefield with germs like the Mongols had done before the Japanese had stopped them with the kamikaze from which the later pilots would derive their name, 
uh, that when Hirohito was made emperor, General Nogi and his wife both committed suicide. Now, uh, to, uh, now, these are three more just human pieces of fecal matter, uh, some of the vilest individuals you'll ever see. This is a fuzzy photograph because there is no life-size or accessible large photograph on, uh, the, online. Uh, so uh, this is an old photograph that is a photograph of a photograph from my private collection. This is Rockefeller. Uh, this individual on the extreme left is Flexner. The one in the middle is Welch. And uh, Welch was our Dr. William Welch, uh, where we get the term somebody welching on a bet, etc. Uh, this individual was in charge of what became known as the Rockefeller Institute of Medicine, today's Rockefeller University. Rockefeller, of course, we can already assume the worst, but you probably don't know the half of it. Rockefeller purchased the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, when he purchased the Encyclopedia Britannica, he rewrote all of history. Together, these three scumbags, Dr. Flexner, of course, is remarkable in at least he was able to control meningitis. In the days before we had antibiotics, he had lowered the mortality rate caused by meningitis to almost zero. Now that we have antibiotics, we have a 25% mortality rate. One out of every four people will die of meningitis after we introduced antibiotics. So he operated in the day before we had all of that and was able to make things work. Antibiotics have apparently had a backlash. Now, Welch, of course, agreed with Rockefeller that basically uh, own or monopolize the medical industry in the United States. At the time that these three men met, there were 160 independent medical universities in the United States that were entirely unaffiliated. Once Rockefeller bought the Encyclopedia Britannica, nobody knew it because he controlled all of the entries. Nobody knew what he had done, but through Welch, he basically bought up every single hospital in the United States. And 160 independent medical universities within a single year disappeared. And after that, every medical university was owned by Rockefeller. And he's in uniform, you'll notice, because he began to serve with the US military. This is where we got the terms of Welsh rabbits, how he controlled the medical industry and turned it into a medical industrial complex. Now, all of this uh, was important because Emperor Hirohito, a marine biologist, could see exactly what was going on, and he sent his master spy, uh, Hideo Noguchi. Hideo Noguchi is today on the thousand yen bill. He is, of course, um, unknown to most people, buried in New York City. He married a Caucasian. That's how well he spoke English. He spoke perfect English. He was introduced to Dr. Simon Flexner, the man who had brought down meningitis uh, to such uh, basically non-extant levels. It had ceased to exist in his lifetime. And uh, he was so impressed by the work of Dr. Venom because Hideo Noguchi worked with snake venom. And uh, because Simon Flexner was so impressed with him, he brought him into Rockefeller University to study uh, for Rockefeller. Now, the important thing is to remember that you're not going to see any, shall we say, uh, normal stereotypical heroes in the story because this is reality and it's not fiction. So this individual was incredibly ruthless. Uh, he is buried now next to uh, all kinds of famous people in New York, like Duke Wellington, uh, fa famous mayors, uh, famous authors, such as, um, oh god, that famous American author who I can't stand. Um, I can't even remember his name now. I, I'm going blank, and that's probably for the best. But he's surrounded by all these celebrities, and nobody knows about him because they don't want people digging up his grave. Uh, and desecrating it because of everything he did. When he was alive, it was rumored that he experimented with African-American children concerning syphilis. Regardless of the methods that he used, he discovered a cure for syphilis. Then after that, he isolated any number of other diseases, about half a dozen of them, uh, trachoma, yellow fever, uh, it, just any amount of diseases that were known as, at the time, he became the Michu Kaku of his day. At the time that he was walking around, he could walk anywhere into any university and saying, and basically claim, I isolated uh, so many diseases, I'm trying to isolate another, I need that lab sample. Now the truth is he didn't isolate any of these diseases. He may have cured uh, or isolated the cause for syphilis through his questionable researches. Uh, everything else after that was a lie because he wasn't so much a scientist as he was a spy and he smuggled all of these specimens back to Hirohito to weaponize.
As a matter of fact, that's how he died. He died of yellow fever, carrying it back to Hirohito through Africa so that Hirohito could weaponize the yellow fever. Now, the Americans, of course, allowed him to be buried in the United States because they didn't want a mass panic at how badly they had screwed up in terms of an intelligence loss. So uh, after that, of course, he was still working with Simon Flexner in the United States doing all of his damage when World War I started. Now, World War I started because basically Berlin to Baghdad, the Kaiser wanted a railway to Iraq. That way he could get oil direct through a rail and pipeline connection up to Berlin. And of course, the British and the Americans and the rest of the world said, no, we're not going to have it. And that's how World War I started. Uh, now, after that, of course, uh, the Kaiser ordered the mobilization of a new weapon known as the dirigible. Now, the German dirigibles were the most advanced in the world, and you would never see them like this. This is because this is for show and tell. They would never hover that low over the skyline because they would be vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire. So the dirigible, dirigibles went very, very high beyond the ability to be seen by anti-aircraft fire. Now, this is a children's book. And a child's book is meant to show you things. So, of course, in the illustration, the girl can see the dirigible. This is how they looked. In reality, the dirigibles looked like this, with all of the searchlights on them. Not a single round could hit them. All of the rounds would fall flat and kill Londoners. So because of that, they had to figure out a way to try and destroy dirigibles. By the way, biplanes that would scramble to try and attack them could not reach them. They were too high up in the atmosphere for biplanes to reach. They were invulnerable for all intents and purposes. Now, all of that was to change later. There were um, improvements in aircraft infrastructure. The dirigibles would go higher, but they would fly across the Atlantic, and that's when the Germans began to solve all of the problems that would later on help the Japanese. The Germans began to deal with the fact that when they went too high, their men would die uh, without oxygen. They, um, the men who were in the guns that were on top of the dirigible, and there was actually a dirigible uh, gun for anti-aircraft fire for planes coming from above it that was above the dirigible itself, those men would freeze to death. So they would have all kinds of things that they confronted and later on uh, solved that the Japanese took advantage of when they became allied as Germans with the Japanese. This is how they look bombing London. That's all you see. Because a battle is not something you see. A battle is something you hear. A battle is something you smell. But you never see a battle because all you see is dust and smoke and particulate matter. And this is what you see is light pollution. Light pollution is coming from the anti-aircraft fire. Light pollution is coming from the search beams. All battles with dirigibles look like that. Now, this is how they look when they get close enough for you to see them. They look like UFOs. When they're shot down, they look like UFOs. All of these dirigibles that were ultimately brought down over London looked like that. Does that mean all UFOs are dirigibles? Of course not. But this is a situation pointing out to what happened. Now we have the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk after Germany won the war. Germany won the war against Russia. They stuck Lenin in a boxcar and shoved him in a train all the way into Russia where he instigated revolution and broke criminals out of prison. One of them was Stalin. They basically wound up taking over the country. At that time, the Bolsheviks took over. They surrendered all of this to Germany and Austria-Hungary. By the way, that is basically almost 50% of their industry, over 50% of Russia's industry was in that small area. Uh, aside from that, you had something like 24%, fully a quarter of their population, uh, or uh, almost 50% in Russia at that time because it was all Atlantic-centered. And also, you had something like uh, at least 25% of all of their arable land. So at this point, the Kaiser had won the war. He had all the food. He had all the industry. He had all the manpower. This is what Europe would have looked like. He could have built his Berlin uh, to Baghdad railway and, of course, stabilized into the nations that are trying to regain their independence today. So uh, he was invulnerable. There was nothing anyone could do to stop him. The Americans declared war, and they said, how do we defeat him because all our men are going to be speed bumps? He can roll right into France, and the expeditionary force that we're sending is a few thousand men. It wasn't like D-Day. There's nothing they can do. And that's when, of course, this uh, scumbag, the madman known as President Woodrow Wilson, was confirmed with people who presented him a solution. Now, he wanted, as you can see, the cover of the book says it all, basically the quest for a new world order to end all wars. And he said, yes, there's nothing that succeeds in life like boldness. Now, this man was, of course, stark raving mad. 
He is probably the most evil man in history. There is no one, no one, that is worse than this individual. And I'll show you why. Because you had Surgeon General Gorgas, who came up to him and said, you know, we can take people right off the streets, almost like a breath of wind, and just make them disappear like they were never there within a heartbeat by new viral methods. Now, General Gorgas was the Surgeon General. And he's, well, he's in a uniform. He is not subject to the Hippocratic Oath. So whenever your Surgeon General tells you whatever they tell you, remember that they are not subject to the Hippocratic Oath. They don't need to do no harm. As a matter of fact, as a military doctor, he's often paid to do as much harm as possible. So he says, you know what? We could cook up a disease. And it'll be just like what we would view today as a nuclear war. If there was a first strike that the Americans conducted against Russia and the Russians fired back with everything they had that survived, America would look something like this, which would mean that they would have survived a second strike. Now, all this black stuff is radiation. It's blown by the winds. This would kill a lot of people, but it would be like the Strategic Air Command going up to Ronald Reagan and saying, you know what, we could launch a first strike and we'll take out everything they got. In the meantime, when they see the missiles coming in, they'll fire what they've got, but it'll be too late, and they'll only kill 100 million of us. And then Ronald Reagan would say something like, well, we got 300 million people and we got 50 million illegal immigrants, so we can build back just like that, go for it. <laughs> and that's what Wilson said, because they approached Woodrow Wilson and they said, we can take out the Kaiser, we can take out Europe, you can redraw the map of Europe any way you want. You can create countries that didn't exist. You can create countries like, that are just make-believe, that never existed before, that have no ethnicity to back them up. You can do whatever you want because we'll kill practically everybody in Europe and you can be made the hero who brings peace. And he says, well, how many Americans are going to die? Well, it's just like that nuclear backblast. They said, 20 million. He said, go for it. And so what they did at Camp Fultstein was they took prisoners out of Letterman Army Medical Center. Now, I dealt with all the records. These conscripts, these draftees, were taken out of San Quentin, California, and they were sent to Camp Funston, uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. This is all in Kansas. And all the way that they were sent there, because they knew all about the flus from all these past warfare experiences with biological weapons, they knew all flus are Asian flus. All flus are bird flus. All flus are swine flus. The reason is because of that is because everyone in Asia for thousands of years lived in subsistence agricultural economies. They all live with their pigs, they all live with their chickens, and because of that, the chicken roll gives the flu to all the pigs, which give it to the humans. Now, a pig has so close to a mammal uh, structure to a human being, they use pig valve to replace human valves. That's what a porcine valve replacement. Now, the birds, of course, carry the uh, infection known as a virus. Viruses have been here since the dinosaurs. A virus is ancient. A virus basically is something that's evolved to fit in the intestinal tract of dinosaurs. Now that the dinosaurs are all dead, they live in their distant relations, the birds. So all the birds in the world form a giant biomass in which viruses constantly mutate. Now, of course, we are, a wind, we are basically a fly speck on the windshield of viral life. When there's no more birds to be had, they pick sloppy seconds and they'll take us. They don't really prefer us. And uh, so to viruses, what happens with the, in Asia, which is why all the Asians go around wearing breath masks and why they never shake hands, why they always bow, so they don't touch each other or breathe on each other, so they don't spread germs. This is why Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini trained all the people to do this, so they, because they didn't want them shaking hands, because that would prevent them from getting diseases that the Americans started in World War I which killed almost all of Europe. That is why they went back to the Roman salute. So in all of this, we get the men at Camp Funston. Now notice they're all sleeping together like a big blanket party. Now one of the things I see, if you ever go on one, this is cut off. That's cut off. These are corpsmen. These are military doctors looking at all the men because they're waiting for them to get sick because they came all the way from California in these unrefrigerated boxcars with live chickens, during which time they inhaled all that particulate fecal matter, all the feathers being shed, and of course they developed H1N1, hemogluten 1, neuromonase 1, the avian swine flu. This is the big one, the worst disaster to ever occur in human history. Uh, basically, these men got so sick, of course, they all died. And they got one patient who was uh, basically immune to it, uh, like Typhoid Barry. His name was Gitchell, and they made him the cook. 
and he cooked for 75,000 troops and infected them all. Then they put him on all these ships and sent them to Spain. Now you notice there's blacks, there's whites, they're all together. This is highly unusual because this was a time of a segregated military. But they didn't segregate them on these ships. And they talked to Spain and they said, we have just won the Spanish-American War. Okay, and we've taken all your possessions. We'll give you some reparations if you let us disembark for World War I in your country. And so the Spanish were desperately in need of money, and they came to regret it because these men arrived in what were known as coffin ships. The vast majority of Americans arrived dead. Now, when they did get to Europe, when they got to Europe, all of them were sick, and they took it into the trenches, and they infected the British, they infected the French, they infected the Germans. They killed more people in 24 hours than AIDS killed in 24 years. They killed more people in a single year than the Black Plague killed in a hundred years. They killed a hundred million people worldwide. Now you would think this was Europe, but it's not. That's the American Red Cross. This is home front America. And this was the military coming to take away the bodies because, of course, everyone in America started to die. This is Oakland. This is in my private collection. These are nurses in the Oakland area who were taking people. Now think about what I'm saying. That last photograph I showed you was St. Louis, Missouri. Now, within just weeks, it went from St. Louis, Missouri to Oakland, all the way across the United States. That is how infectious it was. And when it started taking all these Americans out, they ran out of coffins in the first week. These were the lucky ones. These are infants, tiny infant coffins, children, entire families buried together. And they ran out of that in one week because all the coffin makers started to die. And after that, they had to bury them in mass graves. So uh, let me see if I can get back to where I was and uh, move forward from there and uh, apologize for that. But it allows you to review some of this horror. And uh, when we get back to the mass graves, they ultimately had so many people to bury, they had to use steam shovels. This was in the day before bulldozers. Now, ultimately, every major city in the United States has marked unmasked, you know, unmarked, excuse me, mass graves in which tens of thousands of people lie that you don't even know about. They build buildings on top of them because altogether in the United States, as I said, 20 million people died and of course they won the war. At that point, all of these German prisoners of war who had been kept by the Russians were now indoctrinated in communism by Stalin and Lenin. They went back to Europe, started revolution, and Woodrow Wilson got to redraw the map of Europe. He created nations that never existed for hundreds of years. Poland had not existed for hundreds of years. Czechoslovakia had never existed before. None of these nations existed. There was Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia. <laughs> and that was pretty much it. All of these nations came into being, and of course it guaranteed a second world war. And of course it created a bunch of really ticked off veterans called the National Socialists, otherwise known as the Nazis, who hated the Americans and vowed revenge. And that, of course, was another reason, as I said, for the fascist salute. Now, of course, after that great uh, feeding frenzy for death, he got the Nobel Peace Prize. That was Woodrow Wilson. And uh, so in terms of that, Hirohito saw all of this. He had, of course, Dr. Hideo Noguchi spying for him. He went to visit Britain. And of course, he's a young man. Now notice how modern he is. This is 1921. It's just two years before my latent Satan and mother was born. He's amongst all these oh-so-Victorian British. And notice how they all look so antiquated and archaic, like out of a colonial movie about the Indian Raj. And uh, like Disraeli, uh, they're all stuck in time. But he looks like a modern Japanese student. You could almost think this was photoshopped. He is so out of place. He is so far ahead of his time, it's insane. Nobody understands him, and yet he said this was the happiest moment in his life because of that. At any rate, here he is watching something here. It's Prince Hirohito watches the Royal Air Force during a uh, UK uh, visit in 1921. What is he looking at? He's looking at, of course, the R-23. They didn't give their dirigibles names. The R-23 is carrying a sock with camel, the kind that Snoopy flies. And this is a parasite fighter. This was the world's first flying aircraft carrier. Now, of course, the Americans said, we can do that, and we can use America as our home base from which to bomb the world, especially Asia, and carry out Jack London's dream of annihilation. 
Now, of course, the Americans said, we can use these bases in the middle of the United States for our naval forces to bomb these other countries, so no one can bomb us in return. This is why all over the United States, in the middle of Kansas, in the middle of Ohio, in the middle of everywhere where you're landlocked, there are Navy bases. It's because they had airships and dirigibles. Now, of course, they learned from the Soviets. The Soviets were doing this with heavier than air. They made aircraft carrying aircraft carriers. And the Soviets, of course, were experimenting with it in such a manner that they didn't care about how many lives were lost. And many of these planes were lost because it's very difficult for a pilot to land on a moving airplane. The airships are infinitely easier because they're much slower. So we had all of these spectacular uh, acrobatics and these pilots who were true daredevils that uh, basically took the program literally to the ground. This is a model of it so you can get a better image. And of course, this is how it would look flying. And of course, this is his profile. But here you see, with these concepts working with heavier than aircraft, the Americans still experimented with it in the jet age. Now this is a jet with a parasite fighter, known as a goblin fighter. That was the basis for the stealth goblin, and uh, that was supposed to be the parasite fighter for the stealth bomber. Now, of course, you see how specialized it is. It has foldable wings, and of course, it's carried up on a catapult or a trapeze, uh, brought uh, up in the air, released, and you notice there's a sky hook right there for it to land on, and that way, uh, with that sky hook, it can hook up into uh, the uh, jet plane. Oh, excuse me, that was a prop-driven plane. It's a prop-driven plane carrying a jet. Uh, but it could also carry jets, conventional jets, under its belly. So you didn't need a specially crafted, designed fighter plane. You could use regular planes that wouldn't expend any fuel and be able to defend the bomber from incoming fighters. And, of course, these experiments led to developments that were never really followed up by the U.S. military because they found out they could make a lot more money with aircraft carriers. The Navy took that over. Uh, the Air Force went into building nuclear missiles and went underground. But in the days of Hirohito, in the days of uh, Roosevelt, we still had the biplanes. And the biplanes were still very effective. I'll get to that in a moment. They were, of course, uh, made for these uh, dirigibles that could carry them. And they were taken up on skyhooks, trapezes, as they called them, brought into the dirigible itself for repairs. And, of course, they could be set out again. This is inside a dirigible. And, of course, they had the skyhook. Now, this was, of course, something that would have improved permission to come aboard. Basically, they're talking about a U.S. Navy Sparrowhawk, as they were called, and this was the USS Akron and the USS Macon. Now, they were creating this entire force of bomber dirigibles. The dirigibles would bomb. The parasite fighters would protect them from interceptors. And, of course, it was becoming a big industry. This shows you how every one of them had fought four or five of these parasite fighters. So they would be well defended while they were over enemy territory. Now, this is the Goodyear plant uh, at Akron, Ohio, 1931. Plenty of people on the ground. You can see all these people on the ground. This was an enormous effort. These were monumentally expensive machines, just like an aircraft carrier, but infinitely cheaper by comparison nonetheless. So this was the way that the Americans could win the wars of the future, and everybody knew about it. They had huge coming out parties. Everybody came to celebrate. This was a cele called celeb in America. They had all kinds of people who were trained to operate these uh, monumental machines, and of course they had entire crews of sailors. Now, of course, my father was a sailor, and I always have uh, tears in my eyes when I think of the men who served in the Naval Air Services and the sacrifices that they made, because the majority of these men would wind up dying at home. Now, uh, the reason for that was, of course, you had these entire squadrons of Sparrowhawks, you had dashing pilots, they were known as naviators. By the way, a naval aviator is entirely separate from a pilot. A pilot is someone who takes off and lands on a landing strip. A naval aviator is trained to do far more than that. He can land on nothing. He can land on a dime. So uh, the naviators are in a league of their own. They take great offense if you call them a pilot, because that is something that anyone can do. A naval aviator is, however, However, different stuff. Now, all of these squadrons were waiting to be put to use, and of course, they showed the American public at air shows. There were technicians who were able to talk to civilians on ham radio. The Americans were well aware of everything that was going on. What stopped it? You had this entire industry that was waiting to develop and take off and put America into the new age of air dominance. And of course, this was the weak point. It was the officers.
The officers are like a mafia. A commissioned officer is unlike a uh, non-commissioned uh, man. A non-commissioned uh, private or sailor all the way up to an officer, such as a warrant officer like my father was, a chief petty officer who later on became a warrant officer because he was a specialist, or you have uh, in the army master sergeants, warrant officers, etc. Those are non-commissioned. That means that if you don't get paid, you don't have to fight. And because of that, they're viewed as scum by the officers. Uh, they're viewed as mercenaries. They're viewed as rabble. They're viewed as thugs. The officers are commissioned. What does that mean? That means that you hold stock in the incorporated states of America. That means that you are required to fight because you go down if the corporation goes down. You go down if the state goes down. When the ship sinks, you go down with it. Therefore, the officers have to fight whether they're paid or not. So because of that, they're elitist and they're spoiled. This was the weak point. They had won the Spanish-American War. Because they had won the Spanish-American War, they had conquered the Philippines. Because they had conquered the Philippines, every officer had about a hundred Filipino stewards. Every officer had a hundred Filipino stewards. An officer couldn't wipe, he couldn't take a crap without a Filipino steward wiping his ass. Now, I'm not, I'm not even being facetious here. Basically, to show you how bad this is, there were more Filipino stewards in the U.S. Navy than there were Filipinos in all the military branches of the Philippines put together. So they were all here. And every single one of them would entertain their officers, uh, provide them services. Now, this is 1964. 1964. This is like a year after my late sister was born. Now, this is a class of all Filipino stewards. The Filipino steward class of servants was maintained until the Filipinos kicked the Americans out of the Philippines, which wasn't until the 90s. That means until the 90s, there were more Filipinos over here doing these scut jobs than anyone else. Now, there's a few white men. You'll see there, this photograph I got from a dear friend of my father's who died. He's white. He was the only white man in a class of all Filipino stewards because they finally desegregated it during his day and age, which was like um, the 1960s or something, so that they wouldn't look racist. And he was the only white guy amongst all these Filipinos, and he said, of course, they were all wonderful people. Uh, he valued uh, their friendship, uh, and of course, you see they have a black officer. And of course, he was put in charge of what many white officers refer to as the niggers of the East. This is segregation. This is where the segregated unit stayed until the Filipinos kicked the Americans out in the 90s. That's where the ninja come in. Now, before you start thinking of Chuck Norris, which is, of course, absurdity and gives the name this horrible effect of uh, comic relief, uh, the ninja were, of course, an ancient tradition in Japan. These are spies. These are commandos. Now, the one thing about ninja is unlike British commandos or American special forces, they were also masters of disguise. No ninja wants to go out throwing darts and shuriken when he can go dressed as someone else and do something peacefully. That's why you take him out of the military, you put some of that uh, copper tone on him, and he looks like Leo San Pedro. So they all went in, various Japanese ninja, and infiltrated the airships. And they sabotaged them all. This is why the rudders were destroyed and they wound up blowing in the wind, nose up. This is why they got caught in storms and wound up with their rudders falling off and crashing. That's what happened to the Shenandoah. That's what happened, of course, this is the Shenandoah's rear section, to the uh, Macon. Uh, and they had to fish it out of the sea. This is the gondola from which miraculously a few survivors uh, escaped from. This is them on, of course, the USS Richmond in 1935 when they were rescued. And of course, this is what happened to the Akron. Now the Akron, being a bomber dirigible, had to drop all of his explosives so it wouldn't blow up when it landed. The men are here. The men got out because they were able to crash land it safely. The explosives it was carrying were so volatile it looks like a mushroom cloud. Now all of this was quite spectacular. Multiple accident after accident. That's why the British said, it was a British officer right here, Wing Commander Uller, who says, is the military dirigible doomed? He says yes, and American Lieutenant uh, uh, Hogg says no. And of course, it turned out the British had won that debate because the American public had heard about it and the American public said we can't afford all of these people in this experimental type of weapon to die so spectacularly and the entire American aircraft carrier program that was airborne died. And so the Americans were left without that advantage, without that defense, 
and Japan went to war in China. Now, at the time Japan went to war in China, everything in China except this little strip of land was owned by someone else. Uh, this was Britain, the lion's share, the French down south. You had even the Germans in the Guangdong Peninsula, which the Japanese eventually won that territory in World War I when they went to war against Germany as a member of the Allies. And, of course, you had the Russians up north. Now, China, of course, wanted all of these alien adversaries gone. The Japanese, of course, were willing to get rid of the alien adversaries, but they also wanted China for themselves. So you had a conflict of empires in which the Chinese population was ultimately the battleground. Now, the problem with China is this. All that gray area is sand and rock and dirt. Totally unerable, you can't grow food on it, totally inedible. There is, it's worthless land. It's like the moon. Literally, I'm not kidding. Except for the fact that you can breathe, and plenty of places you can't do that. Uh, because of the dust, the particulate matter, China is uninhabitable. So you have 25% of the world's population living in 25% of the nation. Now, of course, this is 25% of the world's population. This is a billion people. One out of every four people on Earth at that time in history was Chinese. Now, when Japan went to war against China, how was it going to beat that? Of course, it was dealing with terrain. The people weren't the enemy as much as the terrain. You had terraced land. Every inch of land that could grow something is terraced so they could grow more. Every uh, bit of land that's there is rivered. Now, to give you an example of how bad rivers are for a military, Napoleon Bonaparte, when he invaded Russia, lost 20,000 troops to the first river that he crossed. It destroyed his army. There was no one left effectively to go to Moscow. He was very lucky that Moscow was deserted or he would have been wiped out. But uh, the Russians had an evade and retreat policy. They uh, left Moscow empty for him. And of course, they uh, defeated him when he retreated in the wake of nothing to conquer. Now, in terms of these rivers, the Japanese were also dealing not just with rivers, not just with terraced land, but fish ponds, where do the Chinese inland get fish to eat? They grow their own. These are artificial ponds. All of these contain edible fish, not koi fish or ornamental fish. This is for fish you eat. The Chinese grow them in these ponds. Now notice something, there's no roads. There's no bridges. There's no way to access any of this. People walk on these little walks to get in between every single pond. So how do you wage a modern war when everything in that war is against you. Basically, the Russians, for instance, the Americans always say, oh, Stalin and the T-34 tank, and how great it did in Europe. If Stalin had continued to push into Western Europe, which he did not, he would have been defeated because the terrain was no good for a hot rod tank like the T-34. That's why they were wiped out in Korea. That's why you can't wage a modern war with that kind of tank on this kind of land. As a matter of fact, airfields, what about planes? No place to land a plane. You have all of these Chinese with this big roller. What are they doing? They're making a landing strip. Now, when you make a landing strip with a giant roller, what do you get? You get so much particle matter. You get so many pebbles that your plane will bust its tires when it lands. So all the planes in China have had to have underinflated tires. Uh, because they couldn't land on these airstrips, so you can't use planes. So then you get into uh, tankettes. This is what the Japanese developed. This is a fully grown American soldier. They took away the guns and the cannons so he couldn't hurt himself. And he's inside of a tank yet to show you what it is. This is an armored motorized wheelchair. Now, all of this was essentially developed so the Japanese could cross all this terrain. And when it got stuck in trenches, they could pull it out, literally pull it out by hand with squads of men, and then roll into Manchuria where you had open territory. Now, all of this, of course, brings us to the cities. What happens when they came up against these huge walled cities? This is why all the cities in China were walled from the warlord era, from the feudal era, so that they would be self-sustaining, and they would use all of that land and food on the outside to grow food, and raise fish for the people on the inside. That meant they were isolated. That prevented the spread of plague. Because of this, when an entire city caught the plague and died, it wouldn't spread to other parts of China. It would be contained. It would be quarantined. And these are the kinds of walls we're coming up against. Now, look at that. There's no way that anyone can conveniently scale that. This is why the Japanese found themselves often doing a kind of mountain climbing to invade Chinese cities. Uh, and the roads, inside the roads are so narrow, there is no room for vehicles. There's barely room for people. Everybody is crammed shut, clustered together in this huge concentration of population. So the Japanese had to fight from roof to roof 
And when they fought from roof to roof, they would bring their dogs with them to sniff out uh, snipers, uh, sappers, various other people that they deemed to be terrorists. So the Japanese became masters at urban warfare from the rooftops. All of that brings us to Admiral Onishi. Admiral Onishi developed the Tokatai, or the Special Attack Corps, also known as the Body Crashing Units. The Americans, of course, know them as the Kamikaze, from which they derived their names. These were the suicide pilots. Admiral Onishi is the man who codified them and turned them into a warrior cult. He approached Hirohito and he said, we're going to need dirigibles as opposed to planes as, or anything else that can drop tanks into the middle of these cities. And they came up with the concept of the great silk uh, cover, because this is just a silk cover. All that is, is it covers the interior balloons. These are hydrogen peroxide balloons. Now the Americans, of course, the reason that the American airships were such a threat is because the Americans have a monopoly on the world supply of helium. So the Americans have safe ways to build dirigibles, but helium is less powerful. It gives less lift, and it's not as fast. So with hydrogen peroxide, it's much more dangerous, much more flammable. The Japanese were willing to take the risk. And because of their spirit of self-sacrifice, they were able to get higher lift like the Germans did in World War I, and they developed something the Germans didn't have. The Germans had one long oblong body. Now, the Japanese created multiple contingency systems. You had eight of these balloons surrounding a single large balloon in the center. All of the balloons surrounding it were subsidiary. So you had about nine balloons, one large one in the center, eight ones opposite it, all covered for the sake of aerodynamics with a single silk sheet. Now remember, the Japanese dominated the silk industry. The Japanese grew the silk, just like the Chinese. So the Americans didn't even have the materials to build this. So with all the silk the Japanese had, they were able to create these monstrosities floating in the sky. They were able to create containment containers that would be uh, taken up by the dirigibles, and they were able to drop uh, various things. Now this is a bomber, a disc bomber. It's much more glamorous, but it could just as easily be a containment unit to contain troops, paratroopers, ammunition, uh, food, anything you need it. And of course, you can see it from different angles and how it's able to transport this just about anywhere, such as dropping tanks in the middle of Chinese streets. So we have this tremendous ability, and they said, let's bring this up into the air. This is, of course, the M99 light machine gun. Uh, uh, basically, experts estimate that it's responsible for more Allied soldiers being injured or killed than any other Japanese weapon in the war. This is because, just like Vietnam, any American with an M16 does very little damage. He's firing into forest and foliage. There's very few times you hit anybody. The only damage any soldier really does is with a machine gun because the heavy machine guns are what take people out en masse. And of course, this is the Japanese knockoff of the famous German 88. The German 88 was an extremely famous anti-tank weapon that the Germans also used as an anti-aircraft weapon. Originally it was anti-aircraft. They turned it into an anti-tank weapon just by pointing it to the ground. The Japanese did the same. The Japanese knockoff for the 88 became what they mounted on their dirigibles so they could fire down into the ground. Now I've got pictures of that that are on the DVD in Roswell and the Rising Sun. We might take some look at that later tonight because I'll just go to my Facebook and access such, uh, such images. In the meantime, Hirohito himself was making use of his biological warfare knowledge in Mokden and it was there that he headquartered Unit 731 and in Pingfeng and various other complexes in Manchuria. Unit 731 was responsible for biological warfare. So they were able to test biological warfare to a great degree in China under Shiro Ishii by developing weapons at the Pingfen complex, testing on human beings. And the reason that they had to do this was to make certain that the biological weapons they uh, designed were either very efficacious, something that could kill people immediately, or very slow, something that would have a low fatality ratio. Because any of the big diseases that are horrific, like Marburg, Green Monkey, uh, uh, the various other kind of hemorrhagic fevers, like Ebola, all of these diseases don't spread far because they kill people too fast. The person literally melts alive. They don't become a carrier, and nobody goes near them. So the end result is the really big dangerous flus like the Americans created, which by the way, what we know as the Spanish flu, because all the troops disembarked in Spain, was in the records at Letterman Army Medical Center referred to as the American Army flu. The reason it was so deadly was because it was only 10 to 20% fatality ratio. That way people live long enough to become carriers.
However, it was designed specifically so that it would infect only the young, draft age, men and women who were able to become core women or nurses. That's what made it so horrific. I could not catch H1N1 because I've been subjected to cyclosarine nerve gas. My lungs are stapled to my rib cage. They've collapsed seven times. I have no less than seven major puncture wounds where uh, tubes were inserted to reinflate them. My immunosystem is so compromised, it would not react to H1N1. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the elderly in the room or any infants were any here, and thank God they're not, uh, would, would be immune to H1N1 because with the infant, their immunosystem's not developed enough. With the elderly, their immunosystem's too compromised. So the H1N1 was meant to kill people of a young draft or service age because their immunosystem is so strong it overreacts and creates what's called a cytokinetic storm that melts the lungs. So they would kiss daddy goodbye, he'd go to work, and he would never come home. This is why the industry stopped. The Japanese were dealing with something different. They said, how do we localize this? They put it in porcelain bombs. Now the bombs are just made out of porcelain, built all over China, manufactured by many corporations in China for the Japanese or in Korea, and of course they contain living viruses and they found that these porcelain uh, ammo uh, artillery shells, this ordinance, was best dropped early in the morning after it had been cool all night, before the sun's rays began to shine, and at, dropped at high altitudes, it would burst and basically deliver its uh, viral mechanism. Now, the reason that the heat was, of course, avoided was because it kills the bacteria. Sunlight will also kill the bacteria. So all of this was studied in years of warfare with China, and, of course, the Japanese had the soldiers trained to use it. This is why entire Japanese units fought with gas masks and, of course, became masters in the art of biological warfare. Hirohito also had his scientists later on during the war test these diseases on uh, human beings, including allied prisoners of war. He took photos of them. This is actually a drawing taken from a photograph which I felt was too grisly to show to anybody here at this particular presentation. But the drawing representation puts a message across. And the reality is that uh, he had to do it on white people because the pictures he was showing of Asian people being killed by his diseases, the Caucasian powers, such as the Britons, the Americans, the Russians, just laughed it off and said, well, show us when it kills white people. So that's why he ultimately used white prisoners of war and said, look, it can take you out too. Now, uh, at this point, of course, people who are unclear on the concept wonder where this comes from. The biological hazard symbol, biohazard, is so distinct, so strange. This, of course, comes from the imperial seal. The imperial seal is based on the sacred cranes. The sacred cranes are raised by the family of Emperor Hirohito for thousands of years. And, of course, it has become one of their sigils of their dynasty. That ultimately translated into what became known as biohazard. This is how much he revolutionized the entire uh, war. These dirigibles were developed to shoot those porcelain bombs out of canisters. This is how the Japanese were able to defeat armies of millions of men with thousands of samurai soldiers because by the time they dug into these men with their samurai blades, the majority of the men, literally about two-thirds of them, would have been wiped out by plague. So, or uh, terribly incapacitated. This was the secret to his winning the war in China. This is a photo of one of them in action. It's far enough away where I deemed it acceptable to show to the public. This man is dressed, he is wearing organic clothing, and it's steaming. It's steaming off his body because it's literally disintegrating. The biology, uh, the biological toxins they released are so potent, so uh, voracious in their uh, destruction of uh, biological materials that it's eating the clothes right off his skin. That's why everyone else looks naked and they're all dying instantaneously until there's nothing left but the calcium. Now, this is how perfected he got the biological weapons over in China. And, of course, those that survived who might become carriers, there were special units that were trained to hunt them down and kill them over miles, if necessary, before they could take it to other cities to spread the contagion. They didn't want billions of people dying. They didn't want millions of people dying. They wanted this to stay wherever they were conducting a battle, wherever a city was under siege. Now, of course, we get to something that was actually based on some images I was unable to really uh, upload or download. This was the battleship Mikado, the battle dirigible Mikado. It's airy and it's center line cannon. We can get into that some other time. In the United States, we have a uh, doctor, uh, uh, it's a South African doctor who became a U.S. citizen. Uh, Max uh, Tyler, I believe his name was, T-H-E-I-L-E-R. Just look up the man who was a South African 
who got U.S. citizenship and won the Nobel Prize for developing the yellow fever vaccine. And that is this gentleman. It's not Boris Karloff. Uh, the other Japanese guy I remember is, of course, Ryuichi, Ryuichi Neto. And Ryuichi Neto uh, ran a great deal of Unit 731. After the Japanese won the war, which takes a whole other lecture to go into, I've gone into it before. Uh, you can review my DVDs, Roswell and the Rising Sun, uh, for that. There's two versions of it. Uh, get both of them. They contain different content. Uh, after the war, Ryuichi Neto opened up a massive pharmaceutical organization known as Green Cross and, of course, became a multi-billionaire. <laughs> and, of course, this was based on his experience with the war. Now, before the war started with America formally, he came to the United States and was trying to buy yellow fever from Max Tyrell, or whatever the, German, the Sir Afrikaner's name was, Dutch descent. And uh, he, he, of course, raised suspicion. That was the entire point. Dr. Hideo Noguchi had raised suspicion. This man had raised suspicion. Everyone knew the Japanese were using biological weapons. No one cared because it was only other people that were dying. They didn't care about colored people dying or third worlders dying. So nobody cared that they were using biological weapons in China, but everybody was worried they would use them against Europeans or Caucasians. So why was he doing this when Japan was obviously swimming in seas of yellow fever? He did it to throw the Americans into a panic. He was under orders from Hirohito, and of course, at that time, a new type of war was developing. This is a cruiser converted to an aircraft carrier, the HMS Courageous, uh, and World War II started in 1939 in Europe, uh, formally. It actually started in 1933, but in uh, 1939, it was formally recognized as being ongoing. And at that time, uh, the Courageous was unleashed off the waters of Ireland on anti-submarine patrol, and that's when a German U-boat, the U-29, sank it. Now, it was carrying biplanes, of course, and the biplanes were actually quite deadly when they were used against other ships or delivering torpedoes. In anti-submarine warfare, it was a different story entirely. While the Courageous was, of course, sinking, then, of course, many other ships came to rally to uh, destroy the U-29, which had sunk it. It sank in like 15 minutes. Uh, half a thousand men were dead. Out of 1,500, uh, they rescued about two-thirds of them. Uh, the submarine got home safely. This proved how vulnerable carriers are. Now, Taranto, the British bombed the Italian fleet. This was the uh, precedent for Pearl Harbor. It was used as the model. They unleashed these biplanes, the ferries, as they were known. And these ferries basically were able to d destroy the Italian fleet. It doesn't matter what you're flying, so long as you can deliver a load of ordnance. And with that, they had their Pearl Harbor on uh, September 11th, I believe, or November 11th, excuse me, November 11th of 1940. So uh, this was a year before Pearl Harbor. And of course, this is the illustrious, which carried those uh, planes. And after it had uh, basically um, uh, delivered those planes, we had an incident very close after with the Ark Royal. The Ark Royal was another British carrier. And when its planes were out on duty, it was vulnerable. And these explosions are it sailing right into U-boat torpedoes. It's so big, it can't swerve. So all the men knew they were all going to die. <laughs> So this carrier was built from the ground up, not some converted cruiser. It was built as a carrier with two decks of planes that were all gone. And of course, it was built uh, as a purpose-designed machine. And of course, it sank. Now, all the planes that landed back on it had to be abandoned. The pilots had to land because they couldn't fly home. It was too far away. They had to land so that they could abandon ship. And of course, all the other men had to be rescued by destroyers who pulled off, uh, pulled these men off of the ship itself so that it could sink. And uh, what that proved was, of course, that carriers are ultimately useless. This was proven before Pearl Harbor. Emperor Hirohito knew of carriers then as disposable and as items that you use, assets that you deploy, only against people who can't fight back. So with that, we basically come to the Admiral of the Navy, Nimitz, and Nimitz was a science fiction reader. That's a book he's holding in his hand. That's an anthology of L. Ron Hubbard's. And of course, we have that individual, uh, John Campbell. John Campbell recommended that all colored people be re-enslaved. And L. Ron Hubbard uh, recommended that any time we go into space, we exterminate all alien races that we find. This, of course, was the kind of logic Nimitz was operating on. This is E.E. E. Doc Smith. 
E. Doc Smith was a donut factory worker who wrote science fiction books that were the most influential in American history. They were the Star Wars of their day. They portrayed all other races as inherently genetically evil to be exterminated. That's where we got these colored looking Asians that white people are blowing away in the comics. That's how in the 1980s any stories inspired by him still had yellow aliens with red mon on their head as they call it in Japan, the rising sun symbol. And of course this was popularized by uh, Elmer H. Davis who ran the Office of War Information for uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Now he's the man who turned all of America's defeats into victories. They portrayed the Japanese as an uh, insect race to be exterminated, and they hired Merck to design the weapon to exterminate them. Now, Merck, of course, made uh, $1.3 billion in uh, 2010. Uh, U.S. Biological Weapons Program is what got him that. He also made the cover of Time magazine, saying, we try never to forget that medicine is for the people, <laughs> not for the profits. You know, all the rest of that crap. And of course, it brings you back to the mind of all the graves that they were digging back in World War I. Now, what's that in back of them? That's Fort Detrick. Fort Detrick's where they make biological weapons. It's right back here next to uh, all the trading centers and uh, Wells Fargo uh, Bank and Trust and all the rest of that. Right out of Maryland, right in Washington, D.C., so that they can take out the uh, leadership first, I would suppose. And this is Fort Detrick, fully engaged. And it was making anthrax. It basically got anthrax, uh, this is in World War II, uh, refined to the point where they could kill a billion people with a single ounce, if properly distributed. And they never got to that because the Japanese got there first. And that's why the Americans sued for peace. This is where the anthrax was being processed. Now, here's the point. Uh, they said they were going to deliver it to kill off the Japanese people. Here's the problem. My, my dad had been in China in 1937. He knew the difference between Japanese, Chinese, other Asian races. Most Americans didn't. You'd think it'd be easy to tell. <laughs> but of course, uh, your average American has to have instructions in comic book form how to spot a Jap. And uh, they basically got to the point where they're saying things like, hey, George Dietrich, my father's name, you've been in Asia a long time. Now, take a look at this officer here, who looks like he's of some suspect genetic heritage himself. Uh, basically is saying, hey, you've been here in Asia for a long time. Tell us, uh, how do you spot the Jap from our Chinese friends and other Asian allies? So they go into this thing, well, you know, uh, here's uh, J, which means the Jap. Here's C, which means the chink. And here's how you tell them apart. And he's going into this. And, of course, here they show the leaders. Here's Tojo, who leads the Japs. And here's Deng Xiaoping, who led, her, led communist China down the capitalist road. This is what the chinks look like. That's so they wouldn't wind up assassinating their communist allies. Now, uh, by mistake. Now do you think, no, no American cares about that. They're just going to shoot. And that's the whole point. If the Americans can't tell the Asians apart, any disease they unleash is not going to be able to tell the Asians apart. So whatever the Americans unleash to kill the Jap would kill Chinese, Vietnamese, everybody. And that's what they intended to do. They didn't care. They just wanted to kill all the Asians. Which brings us to the Japan current, the Kurashiwa. It only goes in one direction, from Japan to the United States. The Yaseko Tricks was the Japanese version of the Kontiki. It was based on a 2,000-year-old design that was carved into rocks in Japan. And they took this little catamaran design and they sailed all the way from Japan to the United States in less than a week. Carried on the Kuroshio of the Japan Current. That's what carries all the radiation from Fukushima Daiichi to you today. And it only goes one way. 300 miles per hour. That's when the Americans found out about trying to bomb Japan. That's an American B-29. That's an enormous plane. A B-29 can carry a jet, as we've earlier seen. Now, these planes are going down. When they were bombing Japan, they ran into the jet stream. 300 miles an hour. They had to hit the floor so they could bomb Japan because they couldn't go against the jet stream. The Americans had never known about it. Hirohito knew about it because he was a marine biologist. There was no scientist in the United States who knew it existed until they started trying to bomb Japan. That's why so many of them got shot down over Japan. 5,000 airmen were lost over Japan, or rather 5,000 airmen, the crews and the pilots, parachuted into Japan. Only 89 of them made it out alive because the Japanese rightfully considered them mass murderers of children, the elderly, infants, and uh, the sick and the Japanese would murder them unless they were lucky enough to be captured by the police or the military. Now, of course, when the Japanese advanced into Asia, they took all of this land, which in the rest of the war, the overwhelming majority of it was never taken back. You've heard about the Zero, which helped them advance. This is Claude. Claude was the champion fighter over China, and Claude needed to be retired. So that's why it was ultimately used 
over the United States at the Battle of Los Angeles. This was Onishi. And Onishi said, we can just hit the Americans. They're worried about your yellow jack fever, the yellow fever virus, and we just scare them to death and we let them kill themselves. That's exactly what Hirohito planned. And so because of that, he unleashed the dirigibles. They went without any burden except parasite fighters. The parasite fighters only had enough fuel to fly around. They weren't even there to protect the dirigibles because they were too high above aircraft, uh, uh, anti-aircraft fire to even worry. And these aircraft, not the kind you see, but the clods, were unleashed over Los Angeles. And all anyone could see is this. So when the Battle of Los Angeles took place on February 24th through the 25th, they dropped nothing. They had nothing to drop. They flew on the Kurishiwa, the Japan current. They went down the California current. Then they flew back to Japan on the equinoctial current. And Japan, at that point in history, stretched all the way down to the equator, like in the map that I showed you. So when they did this slow bid over, all the Americans said, this was a headline, I actually had to steal from a library, that's why it's folded, Jap planes, peril, all of these locations, and they even give you the street addresses where these planes were shot down. One of them was shot down on Hollywood Boulevard. They even had dead pilots. Now, all of the Americans knew this. Kids were grabbing shrapnel like aluminum. They were grabbing bloody parachute harnesses as souvenirs. The army said the alarm is real. They had no ability to attack back. So, later on, we know that Hipper Hirohito himself was probably in one of those dirigibles because when the Americans sued for peace and asked him what he wanted among so many other demands, he said, I want you to take me to Disneyland. And they said, why? He said, so I can see what it looks like from the ground. And so, with that in mind, we come to that whole Midway trip, and with the Battle of Los Angeles, before we go to Midway, or rather, even if we do get there, we want to end it with this. How did this win the war for Japan, the Battle of Los Angeles? It won the war because the Americans, despite the fact that that South African doctor had developed a yellow fever vaccine and won the Nobel Prize for it, they didn't have the industrial capacity to produce vaccinations because they were too busy building weapons of mass destruction <laughs> to kill Asians. They had no vaccination program. So the Americans had to take a whole bunch of aborted babies and senior citizen cadavers and cook up an artificial vaccine that turned out to be totally infected. They administered it to all their troops. Now, why did they administer it to all their troops instead of the people of Los Angeles? Because they figured, hey, they dropped no ordinance. They were over there with aerosolized biocidals. Everyone in Los Angeles is infected. We got to do what the Japanese do to the Chinese. We got to kill them all when they leave. So they basically injected all of their troops on the left coast, right where we're at, the Pacific seaboard, with this FCC, or excuse me, FDA, I've been working in radio too long, <laughs> this FDA unapproved vaccine. The FDA said, this is dangerous. We don't approve it. But the army gave it to all the troops anyway, and they killed 50,000 of them. And they infected another 350,000, so bad in terms of their liver cirrhosis that they ultimately had to be mustered out of service because they were unfit for service. Now, in those days, your average army division contained several thousand men. By wiping out all of those men that they did, they wiped out five divisions. So the Americans killed five divisions of their own men. And when they did this, the Japanese, of course, responded at Pearl Harbor because they want to prevent the Americans from bombing them out of Alaska. Now, the Americans say it was a great victory. Now, Billy Mitchell and uh, Desiversky, who was kind of like a military version of Zbigniew Brzezinski of his day, they said, you can destroy Japan by bombing it from Alaska. That's what the Battle of Midway was about. The Japanese didn't care about the carriers. They were out to occupy Alaska. So they willingly sacrificed four carriers, which were entirely expendable anyway, and too expensive to maintain, and had already been used at Pearl Harbor in order to invade Alaska. And that basically won the war for them because the Americans couldn't bomb them from Alaska and had to invade all of those islands in the Pacific over a period of half a decade to finally get to Japan. Now, the Japanese, this is them invading Alaska, and ultimately winning in their bonsai charges. This is an actual photo of Japanese naval troops in Alaska. A thousand miles of American territory were occupied by Japan. They were able to bomb and destroy, strafe any Americans who threatened their shipping. They were able to prevent bombing. This is a, a PBY Catalina, like you see in that movie, The Expendables, with Stallone and Dolph Lundgren and all those people. It's getting shot out of the sky by Japanese anti-aircraft fire. 
And once they dominated Alaska, the Americans couldn't resupply Russia effectively, and they basically cut America off from its greatest ally. That's why the Americans took forever to finally start bombing Japan from Alaska, only after they had invaded all these other islands in the Pacific to try and bomb Japan from below. None of the islands or land that the Japanese occupied was ever touched or uh, in any way uh, violated by American forces. So the end result was the Japanese were able to win the war due to the Battle of Los Angeles. Nimitz later on wrote E. E. Doc Smith and said, we based all of our communications on your science fiction novels at the Battle of Midway, which goes to show you why they lost. And this is pretty much what your officer class operates on. They couldn't follow up with any conflicts thereafter, and because of that, the Pacific campaign turned into one dependent on Australia. These are the Australian troops. Their population is practically non-existent. Every single Australian male from the age of 14 up was either drafted or put into labor. So they had to mobilize their entire population. They were several battles in which they killed hundreds of Japanese. This one unit killed about half a thousand. Uh, these are Africa, excuse me, Australian Negroes or Aborigines that were cutting off heads, it didn't mean anything. All the savagery in the world didn't defeat the fact that Hirohito had prevented the Americans from following up because the Americans gave the Pacific, with the Germany First policy, only 10% of all of their resources and fully a third of those resources had to go up to Alaska to try and oust the Japanese. So that is the full strategic impact of the Battle of Los Angeles. Later on, these photos from Sheffield, England were taken so that they could superimpose them onto photographs between the search beams of the Battle of Los Angeles. These are actual UFOs. So in that case, they put them between the searchlights so you would think the Battle of Los Angeles was UFOs. The next day, after the Battle of Los Angeles was over and all the kids went back for more body parts and more uh, bits of shrapnel, uh, the army had cleaned everything up. And when they said, where did it all go? They said, there was nothing there. They were like saying, well, what were you shooting at? They said, it was alien.